happy to be here tonight with our three celebrated Bostonians, each one of whom I'm honored to consider a great friend. I've been thinking ever since the marathon bombing that for most of us, for most of the hours of our lives, we live within a circle of our family, our friends, and our colleagues. But every now and then, something happens that remind us that we also live in a place, in a city, and how much it means to us to belong to that place. And this city on the hill, this Boston, all of us have never been prouder of than in these last weeks and months. So to be here tonight with these Bastonians is especially privileged. I must say, as Paul himself said, I've loved history all my life. And history, as David said, is at its best about telling stories. Stories about people who lived before us in the hope that we can learn from their struggles and their triumphs. In my own career, I have focused on stories of presidents. Now, it may seem an odd profession to spend one days and nights thinking about dead presidents, waking up with them in the morning, imagining them when I go to bed at night, but I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. The only fear I have is that in the afterlife, there'll be a panel of all the presidents I've ever studied, and each one will be given ample time to tell me every single thing I got wrong about them, and the first person to yell out will be Lyndon Johnson screaming, how come that damn book on the Kennedys was twice as long as the book you wrote about me? But to be fair, my fascination with the presidency truly took root when I was a 24-year-old White House intern for Lyndon Johnson. Now, it used to be a badge of honor to say you were a 24-year-old White House intern. It's gotten a little more complicated in modern times. The truth is, I was a White House fellow, a fabulous program. We had a big dance at the White House the night we were selected. President Johnson did dance with me, not that peculiar. There were only three women out of the 16 White House fellows. But as he twirled me around the floor, he whispered that he wanted me to be assigned directly to him in the White House. But it was not to be that simple. For in the months leading up to my selection, like many young people, I'd been active in the anti-Vietnam War movement and had written an article against LBJ, which unfortunately came out in the New Republic several days after the dance in the White House, and the title of the article was How to Remove Lyndon Johnson from Power. <laughs> so I was certain he would kick me out of the program, but instead, surprising, he said, oh, bring her down here for a year, and if I can't win her over, no one can. So I did have that extraordinary privilege of spending many hours and days with him in his last year in the White House, in his years on the ranch during his retirement, and I only realized as I got older what an incredible privilege it was to have spent so many hours with this aging lion of a man, a victor in a thousand contests, and yet so roundly defeated in the end by the war in Vietnam, so sad and so vulnerable that he opened up to me in ways he never would have had I known him at the height of his power, sharing his fears, his sorrows, and particularly his worries about how history would remember him. And I'd like to believe that that privilege fired within me the drive to understand the inner person behind the public figure to look empathetically at each of my subjects as I moved from LBJ to JFK, from JFK to FDR, and finally to Abraham Lincoln. No one more fascinating, I believe, than Abraham Lincoln. Indeed, it took me 10 years to complete my book, twice as long as the Civil War took to be fought, almost as long for Steven Spielberg to complete his movie Lincoln based on the book. He had bought the book long before I had finished, having always wanted, he said, to make a movie about Lincoln. He had tried several script writers before he finally engaged Tony Kushner. He had tried without success to get Daniel Day-Lewis to play Lincoln until he finally said yes in 2010. And though the script was done by then, he insisted Daniel did on taking a year before the filming so he could gradually become Lincoln. During that time, I took him to Springfield, Illinois, to Lincoln's home, to his law office and his state house. We went to Gettysburg. He read countless books on Lincoln on an American history. And by the time he showed up in Richmond to begin filming, he was Abraham Lincoln. No one on the set could call him Daniel. Pictures on the wall would show various actors playing various historic figures, Sally Field side by side with Mary Lincoln, Tommy Lee Jones side by side with Thaddeus Stevens. But at the top was a picture of Lincoln and side by side a picture of Lincoln as if Daniel no longer existed. He mastered his high pitched voice, the walk of the laborer and his sense of humor. And I'd like to believe that all those years, both in writing the book and making the movie, were worth it. For there is no one whose life story has greater leadership lessons for all of us, whether in government, business, or academic life. To begin with, it's been said that one of the best indicators of later success in life as a leader 
is the ability to motivate oneself in the face of frustration to withstand adversity and come through trials of fire. The world breaks everyone, Ernest Hemingway once wrote, but afterward many are strong in the broken places. How true this was for Lincoln. Early on he showed he possessed an unusual determination to rise beyond the adverse circumstances of his childhood on the frontier, where his interest in reading and his love of books was considered a sign of laziness in a physical culture demanding constant effort to fell the trees, plant the crops, and simply survive. He was only able to attend school a few weeks here, a few weeks there, when his father didn't need him to work on the hard scrabble farm. Altogether, he later lamented, his entire formal schooling amounted to less than 12 full months. But so intense was his desire to learn that he scoured the countryside for books. It was said when he got a copy of the King James Bible or Aesop's Fables or one of Shakespeare's plays, he was so excited he couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep. The great poet Emily Dickinson once wrote, there is no frigate like a book to take us lands away. How true for Lincoln. Though he never would travel to Europe, he went with Shakespeare's kings to marry England, with Lord Byron's poetry to Spain and Portugal. Literature allowed him to transcend his surroundings. But there were so many losses in his early life that he was haunted by death. His mother died when he was only nine years old, his only sister Sarah in childbirth a few years later, and his first love, Anne Rutledge, at the age of 22. In the sorrowful years that followed, he found comfort in the realization that all the people he had loved and lost still would live on in his memory. And he began to dream of a future in which he would accomplish worthy deeds that would then allow him to be remembered after he died. A great ambition grew in young Lincoln, much more than for office or power or celebrity, but rather, as he put it, even as a young man, the desire to leave the world a better place for his having lived in it. This worthy ambition carried him through the one significant depression he suffered in his early 30s when the gap between his position in life as a country lawyer and a state legislature and these huge ambitions seemed much too large to ever bridge. He was so depressed that friends worried he was suicidal. They came and took all knives and razors and scissors from his room. And his best friend came to his side and he said, Lincoln, you must rally or you will die. He said, I know that and I would just as soon die right now, but I have not yet accomplished anything to make any human being remember that I have lived. So fueled by that ambition, he returned to the state legislature. He won a single term in Congress, but then his opposition to the Mexican War made him impossible as a chance to run again for a second term. The war was so popular. A few years later, he tried for a seat in the US Senate. He lost, he tried again, he lost again. And though his friends were despondent, he refused to give in to despair. He knew that his reputation as an honorable man had begun to grow. So two years later, he decided to run as a dark horse candidate for the presidency, perhaps the only office he had not lost at that point in time. Now, everyone expected William Henry Seward to be the nominee, the most celebrated anti-slavery orator of the decade. If not Seward, Salmon Chase, fa governor and senator from Ohio, one of the founders of the Republican Party, and if not Chase, Edward Bates, the elder statesman from Missouri. But as it turned out, though Lincoln had the least experience of them all, his unparalleled array of political skills and emotional strengths proved far more important than his external resume. Throughout his long career, he had never made permanent enemies. Even when he lost those elections, he had shaken off feelings of jealousy, squelched the desire for retaliation and the recognition that politics is a continuing game of human relations, that one's opponents today may be one's allies tomorrow. In contrast, each of his rivals had made lasting enemies who showed up at the convention in 1860 desiring to seek revenge. So when Seward just missed getting a majority of the votes on that first ballot, and the delegates are scrambling, figuring out where do we go next, Lincoln was the only person who had not hurt their man. So he won that surprising nomination on the third ballot. And then when the Democratic Party split in two, he won the general election. Well, the night of his election as president, he could not sleep. He made the decision that would define his presidency to put each of these chief rivals into his cabinet. A less confident man might have surrounded himself with personal supporters who would not have questioned his authority. He was asked, why are you doing this? He said, it's simple. The country is in peril. These are the strongest and most able men in the country. I need them by my side. But perhaps my old friend Lyndon Johnson might have put it in less noble language. 
He loved to say it's better to have your enemies inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in while you are inside the tent. <laughs> he was indeed a colorful speaker. Now, to be sure, Seward, Chase, and Bates were indeed all strong and able men, but in the end, it was the prairie lawyer from Illinois who proved to be the master political figure of them all. So what were the leadership qualities that enabled Lincoln to weld these disparate men into the most remarkable cabinet in American history? To begin with, by putting these rivals into his cabinet, it meant that he was surrounding himself with people who could argue with him, who could question his assumptions. He created a climate which all leaders must, in which people feel free to disagree without the fear of consequence. And yet once the time for decision came, then the time for debate was over. He recognized that the search for consensus could be paralyzing. After months, for example, of fiery arguments within his cabinet about what to do about slavery, he made his monumental decision to issue an executive order emancipating the slaves. He called his cabinet together. He told them he'd now made up his mind. He no longer wanted their advice on the main decision, but he would listen to their suggestions on its implementation and its timing. And then throughout his presidency, as all good leaders, he was willing to acknowledge errors and profit from his mistakes. This ability, it has been said, literally turns failure into success. When the first big battle of the war at Bull Run turned out to be a complete rout for the Union forces, he stayed up all night drafting a memo incorporating the painful lessons of that military defeat into future military policy. In his papers, you will constantly see handwritten notes to his cabinet officers and his generals saying, I was wrong about this, and you were right, and I'm so glad it turned out that you were right. And then when he was angry, he was almost always able to control his emotions. He had this wonderful ritual called the hot letter. When he was angry with somebody, he would write everything down in the letter, put it aside, hoping he would cool down psychologically and never need to send it. The most famous case of that is that after the Battle of Gettysburg, despite telegrams going to General Meade that you have to get Lee's army, he allowed Lee's army to escape. He wrote a long letter, Lincoln did, to General Meade, saying, I'm immeasurably distressed that you didn't do what we asked, him to, asked you to do. Had you done so, the war would have ended in months. Now it's going to go on year after year. But then knowing how much it would hurt the general and, more importantly, paralyze him, for he was still in the field, he put the letter aside. It was never even seen until the 20th century when his papers were opened and underneath was the notation, never sent and never signed. Now, of course, there were times when he lost his temper, as all leaders will, but he would immediately follow up with a kind gesture. Over and over, you see in his papers, if I was cross, I ask your pardon. If I do get up a temper, do not worry. I do not have sufficient time to keep it up. It wasn't that he didn't feel the desire at times for retaliation or to get back at somebody, but he was always conscious of the preciousness of time. He knew that letting resentments fester poisons a part of you. And then, like all good leaders, he understood how to relax, replenish his energies, and to shake off anxiety. He actually went to the theater more than 100 times during his presidency. He said when the lights came down and a Shakespeare play could come on, for a few precious hours, he could imagine himself back at the War of the Roses and forget the Civil War that was raging. But his greatest form of relaxation was his extraordinary sense of humor and his own storytelling ability. From the time he was a lawyer on the circuit in Illinois, when the lawyers and judges would travel for six weeks in the spring and six weeks in the fall together, whenever he was staying at a boarding house or a tavern with the lawyers and judges, people would come from miles around to listen to him tell stories. He could entertain the crowd for hours with one winding tale after another. And they often had a point, or sometimes they were simply funny. The one thing I insisted when I was working with Tony Kushner on the movie of Lincoln was that he had to make sure that Lincoln told stories. And indeed, he sold so many stories in the movie that, truthfully, Edwin Stanton, his war secretary, rather stiffly said, oh, no, not another story. In fact, my favorite story he told in the movie, which had to do, as Lincoln told it, with the revolutionary war hero, Ethan Allen. And as Lincoln told the story, Mr. Allen went to England right after the war, and the English were upset about losing the revolution, so they decided they would irritate him by putting a huge picture of General George Washington in the only outhouse where he'd have to encounter it sooner or later. And they figured he'd be very upset about the indignity of George Washington placed in an outhouse. But Ethan Allen came out of the outhouse not upset at all, and they said, well, didn't you see George Washington there? Oh, yes, he said. I think it was the perfectly appropriate place for him. 
What do you mean, they said. Well, he said, there's nothing to make an Englishman shit faster than the sight of General George Washington. <laughs> so you could imagine if you are telling a story like that in the middle of a tough cabinet meeting, people will have to relax. There's another wonderful moment when somebody yells at him, Lincoln, you're two-faced. And he looks back at the person. He said, if I had two faces, do you think I'd be wearing this face? I have no question that if Lincoln were alive today, he could be one-on-one -on -one with John Stewart or Stephen Colbert, and he would beat them time after time after time. And indeed, that humor is something so important because it allows you to look at yourself from the outside in and to truly laugh at yourself, which we all need to do. I think the one interesting thing, when I look at one of the other guys I lived with, FDR, he had his own way of relaxing during World War II. He would have a cocktail party every night during World War II, and the rule was, like Lincoln's, you couldn't talk about the war. You could imagine yourself talking about movies, books you'd read, gossip about whom was involved with whom, as long as you didn't mention World War II. And after a while, this cocktail hour mattered so much to FDR that he wanted the people who would live in the White House to be ready for the cocktail hour. So the White House became the most exclusive residential hotel with all of his friends waiting there for the cocktail hour. His foreign policy advisor, Harry Hopkins, came for dinner one night, slept over, never left until the war came to an end. His secretary, Missy Lahand, who came from Somerville, Massachusetts, lived with a family in the White House. A princess from Norway, Princess Martha, came and sta spent time with the family on the weekends. Um, Lorena Hickok, who loved Eleanor Roosevelt, had a bedroom next to Eleanor's. And the great Winston Churchill came and spent weeks at a time in the bedroom diagonally across from Roosevelt's. So when I was writing the book, I kept imagining what incredible conversations these people must have had in their bathrooms at night, as they, not in their bathrooms, in, their, in the corridor that surrounds the bedroom suites at night in their bathrobes, and wishing I'd been up there with Lyndon Johnson when I was 24, asking, where was Churchill? Where was Roosevelt? Where was Eleanor? But of course, I wasn't thinking in those terms then. So I mentioned this on a radio program in Washington, and it happened that Hillary Clinton was listening. So she promptly called me up at the radio station and invited me to sleep overnight in the White House. She said we could then wander the corridor together and figure out where everyone had slept 50 years earlier. So two weeks later, she followed up with an invitation to a state dinner, after which between midnight and 2 AM, the President, Mrs. Clinton, my husband, and I, with my map in hand, went through every room up there and figured out, yes, Chelsea Clinton is sleeping where Harry Hopkins was. Bill Clinton is sleeping where FDR was. We were sleeping in Winston Churchill's bedroom, which meant there was no way I could sleep. I was certain that he was sitting in the corner drinking his brandy and smoking his cigar. In fact, that bedroom is the scene of my favorite story in World War II. When Churchill came there right after Pearl Harbor, he and Roosevelt were set to sign a document that put the Allied nations against the Axis powers. But the Allied nations were calling themselves then the Associated Nations, and no one liked the word. So early that morning, Roosevelt awakened with the whole new idea of calling them the United Nations. It's where the word was born. He was so excited, he had himself wheeled into Churchill's bedroom, our bedroom, to tell him the news. But it so happened, Churchill was just coming out of the bathtub and had absolutely nothing on. So Roosevelt said, I'm so sorry, I'll come back in a few moments. But Churchill, ever able to speak in a very formal voice, said, oh no, please stay. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. Can you imagine you are dripping from the tub? Your stomach is sticking out, you can say that. So that night, as soon as the President and Mrs. Clinton left, I couldn't wait to go in the bathtub. And then I truly felt I was in the presence of the greatness of the past. But the pressures on Lincoln were probably even greater than on FDR. He and Stanton, his war secretary, would sit in the telegraph office at night, holding hands, waiting for the terrible news that thousands had died that day. At those crisis moments, his immediate instinct was to go into the field. He went a dozen times to the active battlefield, something no other president had done. He walked amidst the soldiers, the thinning ranks. He visited the wounded in the hospital. He assessed the situation directly, bolstered morale, and created lasting connections with the soldiers who were fighting the war. Indeed, throughout his entire presidency, he never lost his connection with the people at large. He would have meetings every morning with ordinary people who wanted a job in the days before civil service. After a while, his secretaries, Nicolay and Hay, said, Lincoln, you don't have time for these ordinary people. He said, you're wrong. These are my public opinion baths. I must never forget the popular assemblage from which I have come. And that at night, he had huge public receptions to which backwoodsmen would come standing side by side with diplomats. And through these receptions and these nightly and morning meetings, he had a feeling for the current of sentiment in the country allowing him to become, as all leaders must, a master of timing.
a critical quality. He later said if the Emancipation Proclamation had been issued six months earlier, he would have lost the border states. If it had been six months later, he would have lost the morale boost it provided. As it was, it was the perfect timing on January 1st, 1863. But there was a problem. That morning, he had shaken thousands of hands at a New Year's reception, so when he went to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, his own hand was numb and shaking. He put the pen down. He said, if ever my soul were in, his in an act, it is in this act. But if I sign with a shaking hand, posterity will say he hesitated. So he waited and waited until he could sign with an unusually bold and clear hand. And then finally, he possessed a remarkable ability to communicate his goals to his countrymen with stories, with everyday metaphors, as well as with a beauty of language, almost as if the poetry and drama he had so loved as a child had worked their way into his very soul. Nowhere I believe more beautifully than the second inaugural. Think of it, the North is finally on the eve of winning this long war, but no triumphal message does he deliver. On the contrary, he knows his next task is to bring the South back into the Union. So the theme of the inaugural was that the sin of slavery was shared by both sides. Both sides, he said, read the same Bible. Both prayed to the same God. Neither's prayers were fully answered. And then the words we all remember, with malice toward none and charity for all, let us bind up the nation's wounds. Well, only six weeks later, his life would come to an end. When John Wilkes Booth came to the back of the box at the Ford's Theater, shot him in the back of the head with a wound so devastating, doctors said he should have died instantly. But he fought for life until the following morning when he finally died surrounded by his cabinet. And when Stanton gave the words that have come down over time, now, he said, Lincoln belongs to the ages. But even Lincoln could never have imagined how far his reputation and his memory would reach. I was thrilled to find an interview with the great Russian writer Leo Tolstoy given to a New York newspaper at the turn of the 20th century in which he showed the reach of Lincoln's memory and reputation. He said he had just come back from a recent trip to the Caucasus, a remote area perhaps much like Chechnya today. And he said there were a group of wild barbarians there who had never left that part of Russia. They were so excited to see Tolstoy in their midst that they asked him to tell stories of the great men of history. So I said I told them about Napoleon and Julius Caesar and Frederick the Great and Alexander the Great. But before I finished, the chief of the barbarians stood up and he said, but wait, you haven't told us about the greatest ruler of them all. We want to hear about that man who spoke with the voice of thunder, who laughed like the sunrise, who came from that place called America that is so far from here that if a young man should travel there, he would be an old man when he arrived. Tell us of that man. Tell us of Abraham Lincoln. Tolstoy said he was stunned to know that Lincoln's name had reached this far. So he told them everything he knew about Lincoln. And then after the interviewer in the New York newspaper said, so what made him so great after all? And Tolstoy said, and I think generations of historians would agree, perhaps he wasn't as great a general as Napoleon, perhaps not as great a statesman as Frederick the Great, but his greatness consisted, as all leaders must, in the integrity of his character and the moral fiber of his being. So that dream that had powered Lincoln all his life, that dream that had carried him through his dismal childhood, his laborious efforts to educate himself, his string of political failures, and the darkest days of the war had been realized. His story would be told. Now for most of us, the chance to have our story may not be realized in a monument in Washington, but rather through the memories of our families, our children, and our colleagues which is why in the end I shall always be grateful for this curious love of history, allowing me to spend a lifetime looking back into the past, allowing me to believe that the private people we have loved and lost in our families and the public figures we have respected in history, just as Abraham Lincoln wanted to believe, really can live on so long as we pledge to tell and to retell the stories of their lives. I thank you so much for letting me share this evening with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.